Amen. Amen. Well, have you ever had a season of loss in your life? A season of loss, almost like you feel like you're, you've been cursed. Like, it just seems like in your life, things begin dwindling. Maybe, maybe physically, your body, you got a diagnosis, and your strength, little by little, is, is evaporating. Or maybe, maybe it's your financial situation, your bank account that was once pretty beefy is now dwindling little by little, more and more. It's funny how God can get our attention most often through our physical body and our financial situation. Isn't it interesting how that happens? And maybe this season that you're in, um, is a res- it's not a result of your own choices. Maybe it's just circumstances in life, in this world, Um, We live in a fallen world. It's chaotic. And maybe it's someone, like one of your close loved ones made a dumb decision, but now you're living the fruit of it and and, and all kinds of chaos. There's loss, and it just feels like as hard as you work, you're still cursed. Has anybody been there? Maybe you're there right now. Maybe it was your decision. Maybe you knew God's best for your life, but you were stiff-arming God and and you made choices you knew deep in your heart weren't right, or or maybe just in a weak moment you made a dumb decision and you're reaping the consequences of loss ever since. Maybe um, you you hit a dry season and you got disconnected from God and, and little by little there was just, it just seemed like things were just getting wiped out of your life. And if you're really honest, you're at a point in life right now, it's gotten so bad, you're asking the question, is life even worth living right now? Should I just roll over and give up? Or, or, or is there hope? I, I came to bring new, good news. In fact, I feel like I'm on assignment today from, for someone in here right now that's lost hope. You've made some blunders, some fumbles, and life is so bad, you're like, you're wondering, could God ever forgive me? I got good news, he's not done with you yet. Anybody had a season of life where God forgave you and restored you like never before? It, I, I, want, I want to share something with someone today that you're teetering on the idea of maybe packing it in. Can I just tell you, there's hope. And we're going to see it in our text today. One of my favorite books in the Bible to tell you that God's not through with you, that he can restore your life, is in the book of Joel. I love it. Because the beginning of the chapter, you see in chapter one, Joel, if you read it, and and I trust you did, if you didn't, let me just get a little refresher, let me help you out. In chapter one, Joel talks about a locust invasion that wiped out the entire land. And you're like, what is a locust? Like, how's a little grasshopper gonna do anything? Well, I'll tell you what, if you go study, just go study like, like plagues of locusts throughout the ages. And when they come in in swarms, it's like God's like, I need to get your attention. Let me just wipe out the land. And I'll show you a picture. There, there's a picture. This is a true before and after picture of what a tree could look like when it comes to a plague of locusts. There's the before. Now let me show you the after. <laughs> and and when, when a swarm of locusts come through, I got I to gotta, I gotta tell you this. A swarm of locusts, check this out, can eat 400 million pounds of plants in a single day. You're like, that sounds like my life. I mean, what was once abundant, what was once just a blessing in your life, now just seems to be cursed. And if it's not your health and your finances and relationships, you're just looking on going, what is going on? I got good news for you. After chapter one, he gives chapter two. And in chapter two, he says, yeah, this ruin is happening. But if you repent, I will restore what the, what the locusts have eaten. And I've seen it in my personal life, time and again. I've blown it. I've done dumb stuff. I love the prophets because even in this season of my life, he's drawn attention to some areas that I'm like, thank you, God, that you pointed that out. You, got my, you woke me up so can I, I can address it, agree with you, 
and ask you for the grace to repent so it can be restored. Does anybody need restoration here today? If you do, I got good news. It can happen. Let's study this together. If you're a note taker, you can jot down the first of three. Number one, let's take a look at the plague. Let's take a look at the plague. It's Joel chapter one, starting in verse one. Here's what the Bible says. The Lord gave this message to Joel, the son of Pethuel. It's about all we know about Joel. His daddy was Pethuel. That's all we got. So verse two, hear this, you leaders of the people. Listen, all who live in the land. This hit me when I was studying this this week. In all your history, has anything like this happened before? In all your history, have you ever seen anything like this locust invasion that completely wiped out the land? Verse three, tell your children about it in the years to come and let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. By the way, thank you all parents that you're taking the Orange Bible Challenge seriously and you're sharing the word of God, God's stories with your kids every night. I commend you. Your children's lives are gonna be different because of your diligence. You're passing it on. Verse four, after the cut, <laughs> this is crazy, after the cutting locusts finished eating the crops, well, then the swarming locusts took what was left. That sound like your life sometimes? After them came the hopping locusts, right? The transmission went out. <laughs> then you were evicted from your house, right? And then your boyfriend dumped you. It just, it's one locust after another. After them came the hopping locust and then the stripping locust too. And then check it out. Look at verse five. Wake up, tap your neighbor, just tell him, say, wake up. <laughs> wake up, you drunkards. And weep. Wail, all you wine drinkers. Why? All the grapes are ruined. They... <laughs> They got hammered because the grapes were actually being produced and they would smash them down and they would get hammered. Now there ain't no grapes for you to get hammered. The vodka is, done, is dried up, is basically his way of saying wheat. A vast army of locusts has invaded my land. It's a wake-up call. You ever have a wake-up call like this in your life? Sometimes the reason for the plague is actually God's love. It's actually him getting our attention. In verse two, it says, have you ever seen anything like this? I was thinking about this in my own life, in our own life as a culture. And I was thinking about, number one, 9-11. Anybody remember 9-11 here? Anyone ever seen anything like this? I remember we were in Bible college. And I remember waking up. It was like our day off. And I, and I, and I woke up and my mother-in-law, do you remember this, Mary? You, you called and said, you gotta turn on your TV. And I remember looking at that and, and seeing the, the second plane go into that building. And I'm like, has anyone ever seen anything like this? And ha as evil and as horrific and as terrible as it was, I really believe it could have been used of God as a wake-up call. In fact, it was. Do you know that that weekend after that happened, that churches were packed. And it's so interesting when life is going good. Yeah, I'll, I'll show up to church or I'll, you know, I'll hang out with God if it's convenient, but things are good. Bank account's good, relationships are good. I'm good. Isn't it interesting about humanity? I don't know, maybe that's just me. But then humanity, and then all of a sudden, like everything goes crazy and our foundation is, is, is completely dismantled. And now we're going, oh my goodness, it's a wake-up call. Or how about COVID? Has anyone ever seen, where, where, are my, where are my seasoned Christians in here? See, I didn't say old, Mary. I said seasoned, right? Okay. Have you ever seen anything like this? Where one day business is banging and the next day you got to shut down the business that you sank your life into for 15 years has now shriveled up. And, and within weeks, you're completely done. Wake up call. I think right now, honestly, I think what's happening in the Middle East right now could be one of the greatest wake up calls that we've ever seen. When you study the book of Ezekiel, and I hope you did in chapter 38 and 39, and when you dig deeper into what's happening right now, possible 
attack from the north and coming into Israel. We're, we're living in the last days. My friends, if we do not wake up, I'm telling you, it's his grace saying, I got something different for you right now. It, it's a wake up call. And that's what's happening in, in, in this area. I mean, the crops are getting wiped out. He's saying, guys, wake up, drunkards, wake up. Have you ever seen anything like this? What's interesting is the Israelites did experience something like this in their past. You remember when they were in captivity in Egypt and God was trying to get the Pharaoh's attention? The eighth plague, go study it in, in the book of Exodus, the eighth plague was a plague of locusts and wiped out Egypt. God was going, I'm trying to get your attention, Pharaoh. Let my people go. And, and it happens time and time again. In fact, if you go study the book of Revelation, chapter nine, do you know in the end times during the great tribulation, there will be like these, this locust plague like you've never seen before. They look like horses, like with like fangs and stuff. You talk about like locusts. These are like locusts, like on steroids. Imagine not just a little grasshopper, but these huge beasts just completely taking out the land. <laughs> what is this? This is God's wake up call that's happening in our life. I remember one of my biggest wake up calls in 1997. You see, I grew up knowing who God was. I would never tell you that I'm not even a Christian. I, I would say, yeah, I believe in God. I'm a pretty good guy. Certainly better than you. You know, I know I'm looking at you. I'm just messing with you. But, you know what I'm saying? You know how we do that? Like, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I'm better than that guy. Well, I, where's that say in the Bible? No, you gotta be perfect, right? It's like, anyway, I remember I was that guy. And my life revolved around athletics and my first team in the NFL was the New York Jets. And I'm like, I've arrived, I'm good. Until that, that day in practice where I'm running down as a gunner on, on punt team. I'm at full sprint. And, and like, I'm about to go tackle a guy and bam, hamstring snaps. And where am I? Flat on my, let's call it the back. Flat on my back. How many of you know the best place, even though it's the most painful, even the most chaotic, like finances are gone. Physically for me, it was the worst and the best all at the same time. Because why? It forced me to look up. It was God saying, Todd, I've been trying to get your attention for so long. I remember in high school, man, I used to go to that youth group, y'all rev students, right? Toddy, time to go to youth church. It smelled bad. I'm like, ah, it's for geeks and nerds, man. And just continue to, ah, you know, I'm going to be the cool guy. We're going to do whatever I want. God's like, I love you too much, man. I don't want you to continue to go down this road. So guess what? Locust. <laughs> it's a wake-up call. What's, what's crazy is you would have thought I'd been like, okay, God, I give up. You know what? Nope. I went the other way. Continue spiral down until I, I was doing stuff I would never in a million years dream I would do to hurt people and myself. Till finally I, I'm in my truck in the middle of a snowstorm, suicidal, dealing drugs, delivering a sandwich freaky fast where God finally got into my car and said, Todd, it's done. Come on, man, let's go. And by God's grace, 26 years ago, I gave my life to Christ and he's been changing everything ever since. And I wish I could tell you I've arrived. Now I float, I got a halo and everything's good. <laughs> no, I still fumble and fail and God is still getting my attention. He's still giving me wake up calls. You see, God's a God of love. He's, he's a good dad. He wants, he wants great things for you. Do you remember when, uh, this is good, this is Deuteronomy 28. See, the Israelites would have known that the locust judgment, they would have known that it was God doing it. And I'll tell you why. In the book of Deuteronomy, go, go study it, okay? Deuteronomy is the text when Moses led pe the, the Israelites out of Egypt through the Red Sea into the promised land. God spoke to Moses. He said, tell my people this. In Deuteronomy 28, it said, if you'll just follow me, okay, 
I have how life works. If you'll just follow me, you're gonna be blessed. Your crops are gonna be the bomb. You're gonna enjoy life. It's gonna be amazing. Just obey me. It's, you're gonna be blessed. He said, but because a good father or a good employee or employer is always gonna be clear on the front end, right? Don't you love clarity? Anybody love clarity? He says, but man, if you disobey me and start serving other gods, you are, you are actually receiving judgment. You're choosing judgment. He said, it's your choice. And so... It reminds me of parenting. Then hey, where are my parents in here, right here? I'm like, it's like, uh, guys, man, I want to bless you. I want to give you an allowance. I want to give you freedom. It's going to be awesome. But if you choose to disobey God, Todd, I'm going to have to do something different. I want to show it to you in 28, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. Just jot it down. He says, but if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and decrees I'm giving you today. All these, what, what does it say? All these curses will come and overwhelm you. And he starts listing out different curses. And if you drop down to verse 38 of chapter 28, listen to what one of the curses is. You'll plant much, but you'll harvest little. You know what that's like? You get up early, you work your tail off, but you still have nothing to show for it. You plant much, but you harvest little. For locusts will eat your crops. And then verse 42 says, locusts shall consume all your trees and the produce of your land. So he was sharing with them in advance. If, if man, I, I got something great for you. I want you to, to thrive in life. I know how life works. I made you. I made life. Just follow my prescription. It's going to work out. If not, man, you're choosing. And now the locusts are going to come in and wipe you out. And that will be, that will actually signify my love because I'm giving you a wake-up call. That's exactly what he's doing right here. Maybe that's what you're like, man, this, this year. Last year, things were great. This year has been one thing after another. Could it be it's a plague to open up your eyes to the more that God has for you? He talks about, number two, if you're a note taker, he talks about some of the problems. Everybody say problems. problems. <laughs> and it's so funny, like some problems, um, they just happen in life. But I would say the vast majority of the problems I have in my life, <laughs> everybody, listen, I like doing this. Everybody just point to yourself, okay? Stop pointing at your spouse. Stop pointing at your kids. Oh, that boss, it's all his fault, man. If he, I'll tell you what. All the most problems I have, if I'm really honest with, it's me. Paul said this, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Anybody relate to Paul? Like, that's me. Ah, oh, man, I really want, dude, I really want to write love notes to my wife all the time. I want to be able to speak to her even in conflict with such grace and tact. Sweetheart, I'm so sorry you feel that way. What I really meant to say. Do you have that? That's what you want to do. But then you get tired, it's late, you're hangry, and what do you say? Dave? Not Dave, Dave is the perfect man, but let me find someone else over here. And what do you do? <laughs> Rachel's pointing people out, that's great. Problems, problems. This, these problems were directly connected. God trying to get their attention through the plague. And some of the problems, Joel chapter one, verse seven, look at it, look at it. It, says, it has destroyed my grapevines, ruined my fig trees, stripping their bark and destroying it, leaving the branches white and bare. Does that sound like your life? What's interesting is Joel is very poetic in his prophecy. And he's actually not just talking about the physical plague of locusts, that will come, he's actually prophesying that the northern kingdom of Babylon will come in and, and take out the Israelites. Because in that right there, the fig tree represents Israel, represents the southern kingdom of Judah. The, the, the vine, the branches, it represents God's people. And he's talking about, and it's exactly what would happen in 586 BC, a couple hundred years later, he's prophesying, predicting what would happen and you can go study it. Go study the Babylonian Empire and what they did to Israel. They, they completely wiped them out. They brought them back to Babylon captive as slaves. 
You remember Daniel, we just studied it. Danny, big Danny boy was brought back to Babylon and captive to serve King Nebuchadnezzar, the king. He's prophesying right here. But it's financial ruin. Look at verse 10. The fields are ruined. The land stripped bare. Your bank account stripped bare. The grain is destroyed. The grapes have shriveled. Does that sound like your life? What was, once your, what was once full is now shriveled. The olive oil is gone. Gandhi. Deuces. Out. 17, verse 17, Joel 1, 17, the seeds die in the parched ground, the grain crops fail, the barns stand empty, and the granaries, how do you say that, granaries? I need some help, y'all, what is that, what is that, granaries, thank you very much, good, and you're like, this is my pastor, awesome, the granaries are <laughs> abandoned. It's interesting, when, one of the things that really broke my heart during COVID was Speaking of abandon, like you'd walk by businesses that were once thriving and there would just be like out of business on the front. Has anything like this ever happened? I'm just thinking, I'm wondering if God is trying to get our attention, not just personally, but corporately. Does he have something better for us? I know he's got something better for me. I know some of the wake-up calls in my life right now. He's not out to get me. He's out to actually give something to me. He wants deeper peace. He wants generosity to flow. He wants prosperity to flow through me. And yet, sometimes in my stubbornness and, and my human part, I, I want to do it, but, I, but I'm not. And I'm disconnected, and I feel it. I feel it financially. I feel it spiritually. How about emotionally? Look, drop down to verse 12 of chapter one. Check this out. I'm wondering if you read this like I did this week. Look what it says. Joel 1, verse 12. The grapevines have dried up, fig trees have withered. The pomegranate trees, the palm trees, the apple trees, all the fruit trees have dried up. No fruit, no fruit. But check this out, watch this. The people's joy has dried up with them. Isn't that weird? Isn't it weird he's talking about fruit trees? What's the fruit of the spirit? Love and joy. Love and joy. joy. Isn't that a wild thing? Do you see like a, like a joyless epidemic happening in our culture? Sometimes I feel it in my own heart. I'm like, oh, the emotional state of people is that. And you see the disconnect from the heart of God. That's why at this church, that's why, what is it? Everybody throw the L up real quick. Do you know why? This is not just like some cool branding thing. You know what this is? Love God supremely, that means above all else, so that he can love people supernaturally through you. Do you know why we lack joy? Because we're disconnected. At least for me. I get disconnected at times. And now I'm wondering why my joy is gone. One of the cool things that's happening in our city is the, the unity in the church right now is the best it's ever been in our city. There's, there's a group of churches. It's about 60 of us churches right now. It's called the Within Reach Movement. And we'll give you more understanding of this as we go. But the last couple of years, we've been doing research as a, as a group of churches to understand the city better, to understand our people that live here better. And we spent a lot of money, actually. Why? Because this was the thought. If we want to reach the people of Omaha, we better know the people of Omaha. We better know what they think, what they're struggling with, what they're going through. And you know, one of the, the key things we found is they're struggling with their mental health. So you'll see it. The next 10 years, we have four strategic outcomes that we're zoning in on, and one of the key ones is helping people that are struggling with their mental health. And you're gonna see counseling centers, and you're gonna see pastoral care teams grow in this season as we lock arms with all the great churches in our city. And I love that we are one church, multiple expressions. Life Church and LifeGate, and, and you name it, a lot of our friends in the city, Relevant, and Christ Community, and Bridge Church, you name it. There's so many amazing, you know what we're saying? We're no longer boxing each other out for bodies and bucks, but we're locking arms to reach and disciple the lost in our city. And that is a beautiful thing that's happening. 
But one of the key things is this, this idea of mental health. And I've been there. You ever had that day where you're like, can you stop these thoughts in my head? I just need to go on vacation right now because, man, this thing in my head, maybe is it just me? And this is happening. This, this joy was being zapped. It was one of the problems that was, that was happening. The beauty is number three, if you're a note taker, I want you to jot it down. But there was a promise. Someone say promise. promise. There was a promise. And I love that we serve a God that doesn't just try to beat you up and be like, yeah, buddy, now stay down. We got a bigger God than that. Yeah, he's a disciplinary God, but he's a loving God. He's like, I got something better for you. And he's gonna give a promise, and the the promise actually starts with you and I because we're free moral agents and we have free will choice. He says, I'm gonna give you a choice to repent and then return. That's how it's gonna start. That's our part. Everybody say our part. Our part part is to turn, is to repent. Look, check it. It's the next chapter, Joel 2, Starting in verse 12, watch, this, watch what the Bible says. This is not what I say, this is what the Bible says. This is a promise from God. He says, that is why the Lord says, watch, turn to me now while there is time. I wanna speak into the camera and say, what God's saying to you right now, turn to me now. Turn to me now while there is time. And you go, no, it's too late. I've blown it too bad. Can I tell you, if you're breathing, it's not too late. He's still got plans for you. He he says, turn while there's time. Give me your, what? Give me your heart. Come with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Look at 13. And don't just tear your clothing in grief. That's what they would do in ancient Israel when they would be grieving and weeping to, to show the sign. They would actually tear their robes apart. And he said, man, don't just come you know, ripping up your shirt. Don't just tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. And then he says, return to the Lord, your God. Turn to me. That word is repent. And you might be in coming to love church the last, I don't know, six to eight months. And you're like, is there any other like message that you want to give at all? (laughs) And I'm just trying to tell you, all we're trying to do is be faithful to teach you what the Bible says and for you to get back in your Bible. That's all we're trying to do because we know that's where there's power. And I've been studying this word for repentance quite a bit because God's taken me to the woodshed on some areas of my life. And the, the, the actual term for repentance, I don't know if you know this, but it's a military term, which means about face. That's what it means. And so it's a military term when, when the military would be marching in one direction, you know, and they're all in unity. If the commander would say, about face, that was their indicator to repent or to turn and to go a different direction. And you know, that's exactly what our commander says too. When I'm marching in a direction, doing my own thing, I will do my own thing. Uh, thank you, God, but I don't need your help. I'm going to do my own thing. He's like, about face. Turn, I, I got something better. That, what does he say? He says, repent and then return. Return. Someone in here right now, this is what God's been speaking to me, return to your first love. You know what Christianity is? It's a love relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a love relationship with God through Jesus. It's not religiosity. It's not do this, do that. Do, it's return. Because when we do return, now what happens? It, that will actually will reflect in our life. Don't just break your shirt, break your heart. One thing that God loves is a broken and a contrite spirit. It's humble before God. It's agreeing with God. God, you know what? Your word says this. I'm agreeing with you. I'm off. It's contrite. It's humble. Have you been humbled lately? And then real repentance, what is it? Real repentance is not just feeling bad about your sin and my sin. Real repentance is feeling bad and then turning. See, it's, it's action that happens. Recently, I had a friend come to me, and uh, I, I sinned against him. I blew something because I totally went mind blank and forgot something I needed to do for him. And I called, and we had this discussion, and I, and I asked him for forgiveness. 
And he said, he said, you know what, Todd? Talk is cheap. <laughs> Say what? I thought you were my friend. <laughs> it's the very thing I needed to hear. Talk is cheap, Todd. I'm going to follow you. I'm all in with Jesus. I'm surrendered. I'm, I'm all yours. But I'm going to kind of do this too. He called me out, and I thank God for him. <laughs> I told him, I hate you and I love you all at the same time. I needed it. How many need it? How many need a good friend just to say, man, you know what? Stop just ripping stuff up, but man, turn and, 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 and return. Repent and return. And the other thing I was gonna say is this. <clears throat> there might be someone here right now that whatever happened, I don't know, COVID happened, you got busy, your family stopped coming to church or you stopped going to a small group, stopped serving, stopped giving. There, there, was, there, was, there was a drift and a disconnect just with the church in general. And there was almost a mindset like, ah, I'm good with God. I can kind of just go pray in my car. I'm good. But the Bible says, do not forsake the assembly of the brethren. It's, it's don't disconnect from the local church. It doesn't have to be this church. If there's something better, I would just challenge you, return to church as well. Return to serving. Return to a group. Why? That's where there's just power this, this release. This Friday at our small group, we had about six to eight guys, and we had a couple guys that were struggling in, a, in the worst way, and I was so glad that one of my homies showed up. He was disconnected for four weeks. He came back in, and guess what? He was loved, not judged one bit, and we prayed for him. We counseled him, and it was powerful, and you might be disconnected a long time right now, and you're feeling it. You're feeling the loss. The locusts are eating you up, and you're like, God, where are you? Maybe it's like, he's just inviting you to return back. Just return back and see what he might want to do. So good. This is a quote. I was studying this. One of my favorite Bible teachers, a guy named John Corson. I just want to show it to you. You probably won't have time to write it down, but let me just read this for you. He said this. I can't count the number of times I've heard devastated people mark the beginning of their downfall at the point they stopped assembling with the people of God. Return. That's our part. How about God's part? You guys ready for God's part? <laughs> it's so cool. Relent and restore. Relent and restore. Joel chapter two, the second half of verse 13, I'll read it for you. And, I, and you gotta get this, specifically if you come from a church background where God is a big ogre in the sky and he's waiting for you to get out of line. I want you to see this in the scripture, in the Old Testament, about the nature of God. Listen to what it says about God. He is what? He is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He's eager to, what is he eager to? Relent and not punish. Who knows? Perhaps he'll give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of this darn curse. Perhaps he'll, you'll be able to offer grain and wine to the Lord your God as before. Oh, I love that. He's eager to relent. He's just looking for an excuse to, to bless you, to restore what's, what the locusts have eaten. Where are my parents again? Let me, just, let me see. I know y'all young parents right there, yeah? Parents of young children. I, I would give parenting one phrase to you if I would, I would jot this down. You ready for it? Tons of love, tons of discipline, and consistency throughout. And when we were raising our children, we would say, they'd get out of line, we'd say, hey, hey, Blaze Zion, what you're doing right now is not honoring to God, it's not honoring to us. Um, would, you choose, would, you would you turn and choose the right thing? If not, you're choosing discipline. It's up to you. And then we'd wait. And I was just, all I was waiting for, <laughs> okay. All, I was just looking for a little humility. Just give me a little bit. <laughs> just a little. I think that's what God did. God looks at you. He's like, just give me a little bit of humility. I, I want to bless you. I want to restore what the, the locusts have eaten. I want to see you blessed. One of my favorite, look at another Old Testament. This is Old Testament 
theology. You guys ready for it? Ezekiel 33, 11. It's so good. Say to them, this is what God told Ezekiel to tell his people. As I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked, what? Turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? That's what I'd be with the kids. Man, why? I just want to bless you. I want to take you on vacation. I want to give you ice cream. Come on, somebody. Where are my parents at? Like my parents don't want to bless your kid. Not the weirdest. Like, Ugh, yeah, I can't wait for them to get out of line. Uh, you parents know. You're like, yes, please give me a little bit of obedience. I would look at Zion and uh, what, I would honor my kids right now because I would say to them, I want to give you freedom. And the only way that I have to take that back is if you give me a, if you give me a reason not to trust you. And by God's grace, he made great decisions. Well, either that or he, he covered them up pretty good. One of the two. And I, Why is that? Because I'm like, bro, I want you to thrive in life. That's God's heart. He wants to relent. He doesn't want to have to see the loss and the curse. He wants to bless. And he can and he will restore. Last thing. Joel chapter two, verse 23, rejoice people of Jerusalem, rejoice in the Lord your God for the rain he sends demonstrates his faithfulness. It's gonna rain again. There's gonna be produce again. I love it. Once more, the autumn rains will come as well as the rains of the spring. You've been dry, you've been desperate, God's gonna send rain. Why? As you repent, he restores. As we repent, he restores. The threshing floors will again be piled high with grain. And the presses will overflow with new wine and olive oil. The Lord says, tune in right here. If you made some stupid decisions and you're wondering if God can forgive and restore your life. You ready for it? Verse 25, God's speaking to you. The Lord says, I will give you back what you lost. I will give you back what you lost to the swarming locust, the hopping locust, the darn stripping locust, and the cutting locust. And this is fascinating. It was I who sent this great destroying army against you. God loves us enough to get our attention. But verse 26, once again, you'll have all the food you want. You'll praise the Lord your God who does these miracles for you. Never again will my people be disgraced. Oh, isn't that good? Isn't that just good news? I'm wondering who this message is for. I'm wondering, like, how did I get this assignment to tell someone in here Man, he's not done with you yet. It's you who, this past year, you had great plans. In fact, your dream and goal for 23 was it was gonna be a banner year. And you know what? It's been a bummer year. You, you said, man, we're gonna put our marriage back together and we're gonna thrive. And it's actually gone the opposite way. I have friends who have been in jail, they've been in prison for several years, they're just getting out right now. And they're wondering, can God restore my life? I came to tell him, yes he can and he will. As you turn back to him, he is gonna restore your life. The Bible says he will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I have another friend, he's got about two more months and he's gonna get out of jail. And, he's, and right now, as he's in jail, he's losing all kinds of stuff. And, and can you imagine being in that position right now going, God, could you, what is happening? Is there any more hope? I'm gonna preach and prophesy. Maybe it's just him. Maybe no one else is getting this message. For you, sir, God will restore the years the locusts have eaten. I'm believing it by faith. As you turn, as you return to him. He's gonna relent. He's gonna restore. Do you believe it? God, thank you for this message. I, it was so timely for me to hear this and I, I pray for the person here that has just had the worst year of their life. Maybe it's the best because you're getting their attention today. And so I pray, God, that we would humble ourselves before you be fully open to what it is you're wanting to speak in this season. Would you give us grace not just to hear it, but 
to turn, for there to be action connected to this heart of repentance. And then by your grace, that you'll restore. You'll restore relationship. You'll restore resource. You'll restore peace. You'll restore sanity. You'll restore strength. You'll restore hope for your glory in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I'm just interested what God might have spoken to you today, what, what resonated. And I'm wondering if there's any Christians here today that would be humble enough to admit there, there's some circumstances that have happened and honestly, they've been wake-up calls. Is there anybody at church that's humble enough? I wanna pray for you specifically. I have probably two or three areas right now that I'm sensing God it's a wake-up call for me. You can put your hands down. I wanna pray, God, just right now, I pray shame would have to go. You'd replace it with courage and also practical, practical help. As you see our hearts humble before you, would you show up and restore like never before? Maybe it's through an individual. Maybe it's through a counselor. Maybe it's through a small group. Would you just do what only, we trust you, God. You're sovereign, you know what we need. We trust you now. In Jesus' name.